Thank you for joining us for this online conference uh, in whose place confronting vestiges of the colonial landscape um, where post-colonial societies and former colonial powers are being uh, confronted with uh, uh, the remnants of colonial history, planning and architecture. Um, Tariq Toffa uh, is a researcher, educator and ar architect. Uh, his paper is titled Imagining South African Landscape, Three Centuries of Landscape and Society in Cape Town. So I'm, I'm speaking about um, landscape and I'm speaking about it in relation to who and where and what we are as South Africans and um, covering a broad historical trajectory, um, sketching out some key, key moments uh, about ourselves and about the spaces in which we live and the cities in which we live. Um, and my presentation consists of a few parts. Um, the first part I want to speak about are, are tools. Uh, tools where, which we can use to um, read our, our landscape, our discipline, our spaces, our society. Um, and also to understand what I mean when I speak of South African landscape. Um, because I mean something very specific. The, the word is a, is a broad word with many meanings. <clears throat> um, in, in, in our post-colonial and, and, and post-apartheid um, context with apartheid as a, as, as, a, as a late form of colonialism, in order to really engage with that reality and its legacies and its infrastructure, uh, which continues to reproduce themselves in, in a myriad of different forms. To actually engage with that seriously, one actually needs to develop uh, integrative kinds of theory that can speak to the multiple facets of, of our condition. <clears throat> and, and this is um, something I do in my work. Um, so what we look at today is the, the, the way I, I um, I approach the analysis um, of, of the South African condition, our space, our society is, is very multidimensional and interdisciplinary. And I think because it needs to be. So um, it, it requires the, the integration of many disciplines uh, in to enable one to understand it on a deeper level. There, there is, you know, coming from the built environment, uh, my discipline, it really needs a much closer relationship with the humanities. Um, than it has. Uh, there are individuals who are pursuing those links, but it's not really the mainstay of the profession. Um, and, and what that requires is really uh, the, the um, spatial readings um, alongside uh, social ones, alongside discursive and symbolic ones, what we could generally call the humanities and the built environment. Um, and these are just some, some key texts which um, I think uh, epitomize some of those, um, the, the, those tools. You know, uh, uh, William Mitchell from cultural studies, um, uh, uh, anthropologists, cultural anthropologists in South Africa, archeologists, social historians, architects, planners, um, theorists of, of, of capital and, and the global economy. All of these things are necessary um, to really have an integrated understanding um, of our condition and therefore to develop effective tools. So this is the first point, the tools that we need, okay? And for me, the concept of landscape has been very useful because it's a very elastic concept, uh, which, which potentially stretches over lots of disciplines and enables us to, to work in an integrated way. <clears throat> the second point I want to speak about is constructs. The constructs we live with, the constructs which make ourselves, which, which reproduce our society. <clears throat> um, uh, very little spoken about is the, uh, the kind of um, folk beliefs almost, the, the, the ontological views uh, and, and, and epistemes that the early colonists arrived with in South Africa. Very little has been written about it, but um, <clears throat> Although the first settlers um, and, 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 and the Dutch East India Company <clears throat> had a mandate to promote, <clears throat> excuse me, had a mandate to promote Christianity, uh, 
Um, by and large, the majority of the early settlers, certainly many, many of them, were, were what, what historians have only called nominal Christians. In fact, they had many medieval folk beliefs. And one of those key beliefs that we have, that we see many tales that all of us know, like the back of our hand, like Red Riding Hood, and is, is an idea of, of, of a Europe where, um, which was very little urbanized and the wild and the forest and going into untamed nature was very much in, in the imagination and um, comes through in those folk tales. Um, and was also part of, I would argue, the, um, uh, the, 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 the mindset, the, the views of the, of the early settlers. Um, because what we will see, <clears throat> um, just to open up broadly, through the, the colonial centuries, is we will see a discourse with the wild, you know, from uh, 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 the uh, Robinson Crusoe, Shakespeare, um, uh, to all kinds of stories about the, 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 the civilized um, Western man who goes into the wild. Um, there's so many variations of the story. The wild is the very antithesis of all that is Western, all that is Europe, all that is civilized. Um, and, uh, you know, all of these very mainstream cultural products. But in academia, <clears throat> we are very familiar with Fanon's a critique of colonialism, and we understand him more deeply when we, when we put it in this larger conceptual and semantic field. You know, we are, for example, we understand for none much better when we understand Joseph Conrad, who really describes the, the, the non-human who exists in that wild, who, who is barely even human. You know, then we understand what Fanon is really critiquing. And these themes continue to be reproduced in Hollywood to this day that we even think nothing of it. To return to, um, to South Africa, um, one of the, um, the things that we see uh, is this very concept of the wild, you know. Um, the, 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 the year we find a very early map where we see the landscape is emptied of human beings, but it's filled with wild beasts and monsters, you know, and we come to understand that um, the reason that we can have uh, a, a colonial imperial project where the land is both empty and wild is because um, human beings have been incorporated into the wild. They have become part of that beastly wild landscape. And in the South African context, we had our own special word, which so violently and uh, uh, captured all of that, which one also almost has to apologize before they say it today, which is the K word, kaffir, right? And in, uh, during apartheid, it meant it was a noun to refer to things, but during the, the, the broader colonial period, especially the 19th century, it was an adjective. Uh, kafir was meant to describe everything and, and th that is the antithesis of civilized, everything indigenous, everything that was not European and Western. It could be kafir dog, kafir plant, kafir tree, kafir clothes, and including human beings, right? It incorporated all of that, that concept of the wild, that concept of the great other with a capital O. Uh, the third part of my book is territory. What does that mean for space? Um, the, uh, the early settlers uh, were obsessed with um, protecting the, the, the settlement and they imagined all kinds of mountains uh, surrounding it, protecting it. The, the very land itself gave itself off to a, a colonial and imperial appropriation. So always these mountains surrounding the settlement. And what, what was outside of that, you know? While in contemporary discourse in planning and architecture, we speak about urban and suburban, urban and nature, but really in, in, the, in the colonial setting, in, in, in this time, the, the, the city was not, um, the other side of the city was not nature, it was the wild, and it was primarily the human wild, right? That was the, uh, that was the great other that the, the settlement um, imagined itself on the on the one side civilized and the other side this this wild nature and we see these early maps about um, the 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 in, the uh, ancient inhabitants pushed um, all the way always to the edges um, imagined to be outside of it and we see these um, 
these imagined um, uh, 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 local settlements pushed to the outside of the Cape settlement. And what we, the path that we start to see over and over, even when we look through all the, the centuries of the Dutch and British colonial period, is there's always a great other. You know, for for the, the during the Dutch colonial period, we see in the first image on the left, and and, and again the, the 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 one after that in the middle, those are representations of 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 of, of the so-called queer and sign, although they never called themselves that, always pushed to the edges. You know, imagined to be outside, and then in the third image of the right is the, is a British map, where now the Tosa are that that great other. They have now replaced. A, uh, the, 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 the quest sun population that have now been utterly decimated, they have become the great other, but it is the same patterns, right? And absolutely genocidal um, uh, attitude existed and, and events that, that are almost um, frightening to speak about, both in relation to how the, uh, the Kwe and the San were treated and the, the, the Kota, uh, chieftains on the, on the, toward the east of the British colony. Um, so that, that, um, imagination, that imagining of a great other that is part of an unhumanly, unhumanly zone of non-being has legitimated these kinds of, of actions. So this is landscape on a geographical sense. The, the geography of, of um, how we have shaped our society. Um, and the, on the bottom left here, we see that the, um, the, um, the Kwe uh, and, and San inhabited all, all over Southern Africa, but really concentrated all of, along the, the Southern and Western parts of the country, which you wouldn't know today <clears throat> because that's now what we now call the garden route, a very benign, um, a very benign idea of seeing tourist sites, but actually it is a site of incredible erasure um, and South African society possesses an incredible amount of cognitive dissonance um, with so much of our history. <clears throat> so I've spoken about tools, things we, need to think, things we can think with. I've spoken about um, constructs, the constructs which we produce our society and our landscapes. I've spoken about territory, how the geography has been shaped. And, and, and the, the last thing I want to look at is the city. How does that actually make a city? This is one of the earliest maps of Cape Town. And the, the shape of the colony and the city is already la laid right at the inception. Uh, where we have uh, on the top left the, the 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 fort and the port, and then the um, the uh, employees of the the, the Dutch East India Company who were released to to set up farms and sell produce, which then set up uh, as they run all along the slopes of Table Mountain, they set up what will later become the southern suburbs, which we now know as the southern suburbs. And the Cape Flats remain an, remains an empty space. And then we move to the farms all the way on the right to the, the, the Stellenbosch farms. This sets up the, the, the structure of our city for centuries. Okay. And it would remain so through the Dutch period. The basic overall shape would remain so through the Dutch period, through the British period, <clears throat> right up until the, the uh, before apartheid and the force removals. Overall, it remains the basic shape of the city. Um, what uh, through the the um, the British period, the um, the society becomes thoroughly racialized. So by the time apartheid comes along, before apartheid, our society is, is already thoroughly racialized and already significantly segregated. Um, uh, you know, when the the apartheid ideologues came into power, they said apartheid was nothing new because they understood its longevity and its continuity. Um, so here we have the city still uh, strung out. This is just before the apartheid era and the forced removal, strung out along the southern suburbs. And there are many instances of um, uh, explicit segregation. Um, the township of Vendabeli, Langa, Guguletu, Nyanga, they, they are all explicit projects of, of, um, of displacement, relocation, and forced removals. Um, the, the, but the overall shape of the city remains the, the relatively the same, you know, 
um, the society is, is experiencing all kinds of social stress and racial and tensions and inequalities, but the overall shape of the city, the, the morphology of the city hasn't changed dramatically. This only happened with the apartheid project, right? We, uh, what at the time was called new cities, almost new towns that were created on that barren um, windswept, uh, uninhabitable landscape for most of the time. Right and and really uh, uh, creating cities within cities, towns within towns, uh, a ghetto surrounded by buffers, modernist typologies, and so on. This is a major uh, intervention in the landscape. Um, and the last point I'm going to make now is where do we go from here? Um, the final point is uh, what is after apartheid, right? So uh, in, the, in the built environment disciplines, the in Cape Town, the first major intervention from the newly emergent uh, urban design department in, in the city of Cape Town was um, uh, an idea that comes out of the spatial development framework. Um, it's the idea of a, 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 a equitable city. If you look at the the diagram on the left, a democratic grid thrown out over the whole of the city. This is how we will imagine a new city, an equal city, uh, uh, um, where there is no discrepancy and lopsidedness and inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And how the urban designers in the city um, imagined it um, was uh, to tackle transport infrastructure. Um, interchanges, as they call it, and they imagine that at different scales. And these are the images of the right, all the kit of parts that they imagine an interchange as, as an centrality would um, would be made up of. Um, and these are some of the projects that came out of that, known as the Dignified Places Program. You know, they 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 are basically what they call level three scale or level two scale intervention. It's basically a local local slash regional scale interventions. They, they do not change the overall spatial structure of the city uh, or, its, or, the, or its social infrastructure, but they do attempt to make a, an intervention on a much more localized scale and that these local things would build up and integrate with, with the, the urban fabric and create, as they called it, dignified which is a very qualitative thing, dignified things. They, they're overlapping the idea of space, overlapping with something much more qualitative in our, in our society. This is the first project I want to show after apartheid. The second project is the bus rapid transit systems, which are being implemented across the country. Um, an enormous amount of investment has gone into them that some have even called it a golden age of transport infrastructure. In, in South Africa. This is the BRT in Cape Town, which is, is, um, uh, comes out of the World Cup um, uh, a period as one of those, those projects that came out of that. The, on, on the far left, we see the, the phase one of the BRT, which is basically a seafront corridor uh, from Hout Bay up to Table View. Um, that's where most of the investment goes in. And then there's another route that goes to the airport. Um, uh, five years later, an extension of that uh, came, uh, was implemented, which is a, a two routes, one which goes into uh, Kayalicha, uh, a black township, and the other one which goes into Mitchell's Plain, a colored township, right? These two bus lines uh, as an extension of that initial project. And on the far right is the future plan that comes out of it. Um, and my, my question there, although I can't go into any detail, is that, is that enough to really change, um, to change the social and spatial structure of the city? It, 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 or, or is it a very conservative intervention? Um, the last project I will show, uh, without going into too much detail about it, was a, a project commissioned by the city of Cape Town. Uh, that was um, produced by Dave Dew and Pitt Lowe, and the um, many aspects to it, but the, the most significant thing that I want to point out is the idea that the, the, the so-called CBD, the Central Business District of Cape Town, is in fact not central, but very peripheral, and it needs to become part of the broader city. And so they imagined pushing out the culmination of buses and rail and transport infrastructure further into the Cape Flats and having a, a, a tram or some kind of inner city public transport which connects to that. So it pushes the, the, this very peripheral CBD into 
the, the, the majority city of the Cape Flats through a connection. And then, um, although it was not directly part of that project, uh, uh, the, the railway infrastructure, which creates a new urban system. Um, my final point and my final slide is uh, just to return to where we started, that we, we need um, a, a multiple knowledge that in fact becomes a new integrated kind of theory. And then we can develop integrated practice practices to have substantive transformation. Uh, because all these things are connected to one another. One cannot expect social transformation separate from economic, separate from spatial, separate from qualitative and quantitative. Each one affects the other, and we need integrative theory and practices to be able to handle that substantively. So what I've done here in this, this image on the right is I've taken that, that very abstract concept of a just democratic grid but to understand that we actually need to have a design intervention there as well uh, to create new kinds of urban systems and then to have all the stakeholders involved to, and the political will to be able to set that up and to understand that when we intervene spatially, we are in fact also speaking to our economy, speaking to ourselves, speaking to our society and, and shaping what kind of a society we want to be. And the last question I'll leave us with Ariana is um, do we really want that though? Um, it's, it's a big presumption to think that everybody is on board with this, but there are many indicators that not everyone actually wants such a thing. So it, it is a Herculean task um, to transform those things. And at the same time, is it something that we all actually want? Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric.